Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mark Brennan. I'm a response sergeant and work for Leicestershire Police. And for the next 20 or so minutes, I'm going to talk to you about why we need evidence-based policing. I'm going to talk about how our decision making can be naturally prone to make mistakes. And then I'm going to talk about some of these mistakes, and they include failing to consider what's called regression to the mean, failing to recognise that correlation doesn't mean causation, and failing to recognise what's called our availability biases. And I'll explain what they, they mean a bit later. And some of these mistakes mean that we can sometimes think that something we've done has worked when it may not have. And in order to overcome these mistakes, we need to take an evidence-based approach. OK, I'm going to talk about the work of Daniel Kahneman. He won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2002. And he wrote the international bestseller, Thinking Fast and Slow. What he argued was that our decision making can be naturally prone to make mistakes. And through a series of experiments, he identified two main ways of making decisions and thinking, which he called System 1 and System 2. System 1 is where we make fast, unconscious, automatic decisions, the sort of decisions we make every day when we drive into uh, work every day. And this is the place where we're experts at System 1. We can smell danger, we can sense it. To give you an example of using your System 1, take a minute just to see and answer this question. What, emo what emotion is this person showing? I think you'll probably work out that you answered that question really quickly. It was automatic, it was instantaneous anger. And that's your system one working. Automatic, really easy. But Kahneman said we also use our system two brains, and we need this to make um, complex decisions, but it's a lot slower, so, um, a lot more conscious, and it takes a lot more effort. However, if we're willing to put that effort in, the more likely to get the right answer. So, again, Try and use your system two decision making here. And try and answer this question. I probably need to give you a little bit longer to try and answer that question. Um, so if you want to stop the video at this point to try and answer that, you can. Um, but this is an example of using your system two brains. It takes a lot of hard work. And if you don't use a calculator, it would take a lot longer as well. For those um, mathematicians amongst us, that is the answer. Okay, so we've talked about system one and system two. System one is easy, quick decision making. System two is a lot slower, more conscious, harder work. And Kahneman argued that us as humans, we don't like to put that hard work in, so we'll try and take a shortcut. So, for example, on that last question, we may just work out what's 20 times 20? 400, and that would do, that's close enough. Um, but the problem is, sometimes we try and make decisions using our system one, when really we should use our system two and take a bit of time, but we don't, and that leads us to making mistakes. The first one of these mistakes I want to talk about is what Conrad called System 1 failing to consider what's called regression to the mean. Okay, so what, what does regression to the mean mean? And that is basically where unusually large or small measurements tend to be followed naturally by measurements that are closer to the average. And perhaps if I show you a graph that would be easy to explain. Basically, every large score and every low score is more likely to be followed by something that's a little bit lower or a little bit higher. Things go up and down, up and down, and that is regression to the mean. That graph is last year police's burglary figures for the last 10 years. 
But it's not just career crime, true of crime figures. It also applies to lots of other scores. So that is the FTSE 100 for the first six months of this year. As you can see, scores go up and down, up and down. Particular high points will likely be followed by the next point, which is a little bit lower. And that's regression to the mean. Another example, rainfall in June over the last 100 years. Scores go up and down naturally. High scores will tend to be followed by something that's just not as high. All right, so we're beginning to get an understanding of what regression to the mean is all about. Why am I telling you that as police officers, police staff, police students? Why does that matter? If you use your system one brain without thinking about it, regression to the mean can prove absolutely any intervention. So we take the graph of burglary figures. Burglary hits a peak, perhaps there. Burglary is a big problem. We need to do something about burglary. Police respond in a system one way. We need to do lots of stuff. So we're more likely to take action when we hit those peaks. But we often fail to take an evidence-based approach. We just do loads of stuff. And after the results naturally become more normal, which due to regression to the mean they probably would have done anyway, we think that we caused that drop when actually it's potentially just random. The only way we can know whether our intervention works or not is if we take an evidence-based approach. So that's regression to the mean, that's one mistake that we commonly um, overlook when we use System 1 only. System 1 also struggles to recognise the idea that correlation doesn't mean causation. Okay, again, what does that mean? Well, that is the idea where System 1 tends to believe that just because two things occur at the same time, that one necessarily causes the other, which is not the case. Why does this matter? Well, again, we, we're in the police, we often claim that our activity caused that crime job, but we solved that problem just because we did some police activity at the same time as that crime job. But we often do that without any evidence-based evaluation. However, if you look at this graph, would you, would you argue that the ice cream salesman was responsible for a violent crime? rise. Again, if you use your system one brain without thinking about it, you could fall into that trap. And there are some examples of uh, correlation not necessarily meeting, meaning causation from out there in the wider world. Um, I'm from Leicester, I'm a Leicester City football fan. And for those of you who aren't football fans or you're not from Leicester watching this video, Leicester City, around March 2015, rock bottom for the Premier League. 20 of out of 20. Going nowhere, going red, getting relegated. But then something just happened out of the blue. They just started winning, and then winning, and then winning. And miraculously, they avoided relegation towards the end of that season. And then the next season started, and then they started winning, and winning, and winning, and winning, and winning, and winning, until they actually won the Premier League. They finished first out of 20, within just over a year. So, how did this happen? Was this better training? Was this better players? Different manager? No. The media would have you believe that it was Richard III, a medieval king found in a car park, who was reinterred into Leicester Cathedral at exactly the same time when Leicester City started winning again. And here, these are the headlines. And 
when you look at the statistics, it is quite seductive. 29 games before and 29 games after the return, re-internment, points, points per game, win percentage, it's massively different. Are we really saying that to win the Premier League you have to find a medieval king um, buried in a car park in your city? Perhaps not. Corin, just because two events occur at the same time, we can't say that one causes the other. We must take an evidence-based approach. Alright, Coleman also talks about another mistake we commonly make, and that's what's called availability bias. And that's the notion that if I can imagine it, then it must be likely. But by the same token, if I can't imagine it, then it, it can't be likely, it just can't happen. And this leads to the public perhaps being scared about something that's quite rare, whereas something that is a lot more common we dismiss just because we don't hear about it as often. This is where we ignore statistical evidence and instead we rely on vivid single events or our own experience that are, that are not easily remembered but not necessarily representative of the majority. Okay, so we're just going to give a, a little example of a potential availability bias. I'm going to ask you just to take a minute, stop the video for, for a minute and try and think about how many people in the USA die of heart disease and murder as a result of firearms in 2003. Just take a minute to, to stop the video and have a think about how many people died in the USA in 2013 due to those two causes. Okay, so heart disease, 611,000. Murder as a result of firearms, 11,208. And what we find when we, I've done this a couple of times now, what we find is that people um, massively underestimate the numbers of heart disease and quite significantly overestimate the number of murders as a result of firearms. And don't get me wrong, those murders as a result of firearms are still exceptionally high compared to our country. Um, but this is an example of our availability bias. When, I guess in the UK, when we look at the news, it's quite common that we might see a news story about someone in the USA being murdered as a result of firearms. But how likely is it that we're going to hear a news story saying today 2,000 people in the USA died of heart disease, unlikely, and that affects our availability bias. And just to put a little bit of evidence on that, I asked 39 Leicestershire PCSOs the same question, and those were the averages, again showing that we significantly underestimate the numbers of people who died as a result of heart disease, and we significantly overestimate those who died as a result of murder, as a result of firearms. Again, same message. We can't just use our system one to, just, to interpret these statistics. We need to use our system two and take an evidence-based approach. Okay, so how can you protect against these mistakes? by taking an evidence-based approach, which I've been saying again and again. But what does that mean? Well, Kahneman argues that in order to conclude that a treatment is effective, you must compare a group of patients who receive this treatment to a control group that receives no treatment. So if you are going to test an intervention in the world of policing, one way that you can take an evidence-based approach is consider a control group, a similar group that does not receive your intervention. And then you can compare between the group that receives your intervention and the group that doesn't. And that is one way we can use our system to and prevent making some of these mistakes.
All right, just to finish off then, we spoke about how our um, reliance on using system one thinking can mean that we're naturally prone to make mistakes. Some of these mistakes include failing to consider regression to the mean, where an exceptionally high score is likely to be followed by a score that's lower, regardless of what us or other people do. Failing to recognise that correlation doesn't mean causation, or in other words, that just because two things occur at the same time doesn't mean that one necessarily causes the other. And failing to recognise our availability biases in that just because something appears likely doesn't mean that it is. These mistakes can mean that sometimes we think something we've done has worked when it may not have. And to overcome this, we need to take an evidence-based approach. And one way we can do that is by consider utilising a control group who does not, who do not receive our intervention. Okay, um, I'll be Mark Brennan. This is uh, why, do, why do we need evidence-based policing? Thank you.